They're going to win struggle. I'm, I'm convinced America is going to be one of the first countries in the world that starves to death sitting in nice houses, nice cars, watching football. And they're just going to starve to death because they won't know how to get rid of everything in their life to focus on the needs of actually being alive. Mm -hmm. So we find here that obeying God's commands was trusting God to provide. He gave them ample warning and time to do so. So it had been tempting the Lord to ignore the warning and saying, God's got this. And doing nothing to partner with him in the solution. The warning of God is often the first step to the provision of God. Right? And so God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, told the people in the book of Acts, the famine is coming. Take care of my church. The church goes, okay, guys, the famine's coming. What are we going to do about this? Oh, we'll just trust God to come through. Well, he just came through, people. Now you need to get your butt in gear and make it happen. Right? Brotherlamps.com Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our time together today. Give us the Holy Spirit, guide us into your truth, help us understand uh, the wise ways of the Lord, and apply them to our lives. And we thank you for being with us, watching over us, protecting us, and being our hope in this crazy, crazy world we live in. And so we love you very much, and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So today we will be talking about... The Prepper's Bible. No, it's not a, a new version of the scriptures. Uh, it's basically the Bible, the Bible's uh, concepts on uh, preparedness. The Prepper's Bible. Um, the Days of Noah. Okay, so we're here at the top of page one. It says, a prudent man sees danger and hides himself, but the simple pass on and suffer for it. Proverbs 22, 3, right? So what does the Bible say about preparedness? Is it even biblical or a lack of faith? Let's take a look. So we're going to take a look at a case study of Noah. Here we go. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate and they drank and they married wives and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So also it was in the days of Lot. They ate and they drank, they bought and they sold. They planted, they built, but the day, uh, but the day of Lot out of... But the day Lot went out of the side, I'm sorry, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Luke 17, 26 through 27. So, in our case study, let's do a question. Question, how was it in the days of Noah and what were the wicked doing? It says, they ate, they drank, and they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered, had entered into the ark. So they pretended that everything was okay and kept living their lives as normal, giving no thought to the destruction that was about to come. Now I have a little note. We should remember that doing these activities will be the, be the ones who will be getting the mark of the beast. So let's read. He says, he causes all the small and great, rich and poor, and the free and slave to be given a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads that no one will be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16 through 17, right? So clearly, the righteous will not be partaking in the world commerce system at the end of time, as we know that the righteous will refuse the mark, okay? So Jesus gives us this, like, this is what it'll be like. It'll be like in the days of Noah, okay? And so we have to understand that the people eating, drinking, giving, in the marriage are the ones that are giving God the middle finger, getting the mark of the beast, and just going about their lives as if everything is okay, right? So they refuse to adapt. So let's go to the next part. So if those living it up are the wicked, then Noah must be the example of the righteous, right? So Jesus is giving us two examples, the righteous and the wicked. He says the wicked are doing this. They're going to take the mark. They're going to go about their lives. Okay, uh, so if the if those living it up are the wicked, then Noah must be the example of the righteous, right? So Yahweh said to Noah, Come with all of your household into the ship, for I have seen your righteousness before me in this generation. Genesis 7.1. So it's a kind of a backup to verse. Right? Now, I love that because he was righteous among his generation. It doesn't mean he was super righteous. You know, he was just the one that was better than a bad lot. You know, the best of a bad bunch is the impression you get there, right? And so... God was like, you're it, guy. Come on. You know, and I love that because it's for I've seen your righteousness before me in this generation. In other words, eh, you know, for this right. You're better than everybody else. So I'm, I choose you. And so, uh, <laughs> so, but he's the example of the righteous. Okay. So question. Then what was it that righteous Noah was doing? Answer, by faith, Noah had been warned by God of the things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Hebrews 11, 7. Okay? So, we find... Noah, during this time, building the ark of safety for the saving of his house, through obedience, he went to work and proactively trusted in God. 
right? And so this is what righteous do. So we go back to the thing. We have the wicked eating, drinking, giving in the marriage, buying, selling, trading. And then righteous Noah during the same time, I mean, he did it for 100 years, right? That's some warning. I mean, that's a lot of warning. So imagine doing it for 100 years, right? That you're like prepping for 100 years for the end of mankind, Right, you're missing parties, you're investing all you own into your project of building this boat, you know. So I take some some deep conviction that like God said this is happening, we need to just put the rubber to the road and invest because this is coming. You know, and so after a hundred years, I mean imagine that and then having children being born and I mean it's just it boggles the mind. I'm not even half that, so I couldn't imagine spending my entire life building a boat. But anyways, you know, uh, next part. So we have righteous Noah, who moved with fear. Fear of what? Fear of the destruction, fear, godly fear of God. You know, understand that. Listen, this guy, guys, this is coming. This is happening, okay? So question, what about supplies and food for Noah and his family? Answer. And take for yourself all food that is eaten, and you shall gather for yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Noah did so according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Genesis 6, 21 through 22. So not only did God warn him, not only did God warn him that there was going to be a supply chain issue, <laughs> you know, he told him, build the ark. Fill it for, full of your food, right? Build it full of all the provisions you can keep, uh, can get and uh, and then keep rocking, you know, the, the, the program here. So let me read right here. So while natural provision was available to be gathered and stored, God told Noah to do just that. Gather and store for the saving of his house according to Jesus. The lost wicked will think this is foolishness as they keep living it up. Right? So imagine all the mockery Noah went through trying to warn people. I've told so many people, like, listen, guys, it's not going to be great. You know, I, I have, like, over 200 contacts, I think, in my phone. I, I contacted every single person in my phone. <clears throat> and probably five or six of them were like, thanks. I mean, think about that. That's nuts. Anyways, since Jesus said that at the end of time it will be like the days of Noah, then we can determine that righteousness are, uh, the righteous are making necessary provisions for their own well-being as God provides them opportunity. They are not prioritizing entertainment, advancements, or the endeavors of this life. No, they are putting first and foremost the necessary provisions of their physical life, food, water, shelter, and fire. Right? And so this is what Noah was doing. So Jesus says it will be as in the days of Noah. The righteous will be preparing. The wicked will be living it up. Right? And we will be building an ark of safety of some sort, type, whatever kind God puts on your heart to do. That's what you'll be investing your time into because you see it coming. The writing's on the wall. And the wicked are going to laugh at you for it. Mm -hmm. Right? And so forget the wicked. You know, they're going to drown or burn up. Okay. So God, our provider. So we're going to look at some examples here. The following are some more examples of how God provided for those trusting him, the church. Okay. Uh, one of them named Agabus got up and predicted by the spirit that a severe famine was about to come over the whole inhabited world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Acts eleven twenty eight. All right, so this is from Josephus, a Roman historian. It says, The fourth Roman emperor, A.D. 41 through 54, Roman historians mention several famines during his reign. For this one in Judea and the adjacent countries took place A.D. 41, right? And so... What basically that was a five to ten year warning, okay? So what it says, how did God provide? So the disciples, each in accordance with his financial ability, right? There's key, decided to send relief to the brothers in Judea. They did so, sending their financial aid to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Acts eleven, twenty nine through thirty, right? And so this warning was a super advanced warning. This is like a five to ten years, like not next year. It's like, okay, guys, just like with Noah, hey guys, this is coming. Prepare yourselves, right? I hate the term that God is never late, but he's never, uh, he's, he's always, or never early, never late, but always right on time. I hate that term. God is always as early as you want him to be and are willing to notice it's him. Okay. People all say that because they're, they have to get to such dire straits before they recognize it's God who has showed up. Right. As soon as you're willing to recognize it's God, he will show up. Okay. And so like in this ministry, that we, we have and stuff, you know, I'm benefiting from preparations I did a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Think about that, you know. So God gives you more warning if you're willing 
to open up your eyes and see it's him. He'll provide for your needs way ahead of advance, not at the last minute. You know, only people that don't recognize it's God get it the last minute. Not always. Sometimes it happens to us too. But the point is this. As soon as you want to recognize it's God, God's willing to work on your behalf, okay? He wants the credit. So let him get the credit. Okay. So how did God provide? Uh, we just read that. So we see that around five to ten years um, before the famine, God warns that it was coming. How do we see God providing? With the warning, right? And the church preparing for it by sending funds ahead of the famine to prepare the church with stores of goods. Right. And so the warning was part of the provision. OK, we want to keep putting that in our head. The warning is part of the provision. Right. Even the gospel warning, repent, you know, and uh, seek first the kingdom of heaven. You know, basically the message of John the Baptist and Jesus, they repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That warning is the provision. That warning is telling, get your butt in gear, guys. It's coming, all right? And so we need to understand the warning is the first step to provision. Okay, so we find here that obeying God's commands was trusting God to provide. He gave them ample warning and time to do so. So it have been tempting the Lord to ignore the warning and saying, God's got this. And doing nothing to partner with him in the solution. The warning of God is often the first step to the provision of God. Right? And so God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, told the people in the book of Acts, the famine is coming take care of my church, the church goes, okay, guys, the fame is coming. What are we going to do about this? Oh, we'll just trust God to come through. Well, he just came through, people. Now you need to get your butt in gear and make it happen, right? Okay, and so I want to challenge you before we go to page three, how many miracles in the Bible can you think of, I can think of the creation of Adam, that, that God didn't have a human participant in it? There isn't one. Oh, wow. Right. So, yeah. So think about all the miracles, because like almost in church today, it's taught like, you know, that like, you know, that God just does stuff without participation from the body of Christ or the his prophets or his believers. You can't find it in scripture. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm just going to sit here and a hundred dollar bill will show up on my table. Not that it can't happen, but in biblical standard, mm -hmm. the biblical standard is there's participation. He always uses someone else. Right. There's some intervention of humanity. There's a partnership between God and man. Right. So what do we find here? We saw that with Noah. Yes, God was like, build an ark. Now, everybody's like, well, why didn't God build the ark? Why didn't God fill it up? Why didn't he just transport all the animals in there? Because that's not the way God does things. God yeah. wants to participate with you. He wants you to be involved. Right. And so if he's just going to sit and do everything for you, or you sit on your fat, lazy butt sitting and watching Netflix, you know, that's not a relationship. <laughs> right. And so that's not what God does, people. Okay, so top of page three. It's a manner of obedience, too. It is, right? And so what does it provide? It's like who doesn't, who has children or have had raised children? You love doing stuff with your kids. You want them to do stuff with you. You want to do stuff with them. There's unity. It's great. It's fun, right? It's the same thing with God. You know, and so God... And when you ask him to do something, you want him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. Okay, so number three. Again, how do we see the Lord providing for the church? And all who believed were together uh, and had all things in common, then they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all according to anyone who had need. Acts 2, 44 through 45. This time, God puts in the hearts of the people to sell what they have and to give to each other. It takes people partnering with God when God says move to accomplish the will of God. Yeah. Right. And so this is our this is and we're going to keep going. I got tons of examples here, but this is what we find in scripture. Right. And so this if we want to act, look at the end of time, which we're, I believe we're so heading into. Right. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a different mindset, a different priority set, a different look at life and what is important and what is not important. We're going to have to shift. You know, we're all trained in the ways of the world and what the priorities of the world are. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're going to have to break. All that, right? We're going to have to just smash it down to nothing and go, what are the real priorities? Spreading the gospel, having a household that worships God, taking care of our physical needs. Because the Bible said, with food and raiment, be content. Mm -hmm. Right? So food and clothing. So it's going to get to the point. You're not going to be able to invest your, yeah, you're not going to be able to invest your money into a bunch of stuff that's not food and raiment. That's right. And those people that try to straddle a fence of trying to keep everything they have in the world and not for their earthly needs, right, to just be alive. They're going to win struggle. I'm, I'm convinced America is going to be one of the first countries in the world that starves to death sitting in nice houses, nice cars, watching football. And they're just going to starve to death because they won't know how to get rid of everything in their life to focus on the needs of actually being alive. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that and that's the dirty trick the devil is pulling on everybody right now. We have been so entrenched in it, mm-hmm. you know, that this is life and this these are the important things. No, the important things is God, family, right. mm-hmm. getting some food in your belly, some bread and some water. Those are the important things. Mm-hmm. You know, all the other stuff is fun things. I'm not saying it's not fun. I love watching a football game or playing some video games. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm good. But I have to put it in the right priority. Right. You know, it's lower down in the total. And I don't want to use the word totem pole. There's things that are evil. <laughs> you know, the scale of things, you know. And so uh, we have to remember that. Okay, so let's look at Joseph. The warning from God. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, both dreams of Pharaoh have the same meaning. God has revealed to Pharaoh that he is about to do. The seven good cows represent seven years, and the seven good heads of grain represent seven years. Both dreams have the same meaning. The seven lean, bad-looking cows that came up after them represented seven years, and do the seven empty heads of grain burned with the east wind. They represent seven years of famine. Yay. This is just what I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh that he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the whole land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will occur after them, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will devastate the land. The previous abundance of the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows, for the famine will be very severe. Genesis 41, 25-31. So as we talked earlier, the warning of God is often the first step to the provision of God. Just like the church, God sends a warning. Look, guys, it's going to get bad, so act now. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, let's see. How did God provide? Pharaoh should do this. He should appoint officials throughout the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should gather all the excess food during those years good years that are coming by Pharaoh's authority authority they should store up grain so the cities will have food and they shall preserve it this food uh, food should be held in storage for the land in preparation for the seven years of famine that will occur throughout the land of Egypt in this way the land will survive the famine Genesis 41 33 through 36 so taking the warning to heart and adhering to the advice of God through Joseph Pharaoh obeys and follows the steps given by God God provides when people obey his warning Right. And so we're I'm, we'll keep hammering this trend we find in scripture. Right. But it's warning, obedience and action. Right. Now, there's a lot of Christians out there like God's got this. Like, no, you're derelict in your duty. You're not paying attention to what's going on. You're being like a, our, our initial verse that, you know, wise man sees trouble and hides himself. But the ignorant just go and pay the price, basically, exactly. you know. And so if we're looking at the whole entire Global food chain collapsing around us in famine and drought. We have to go. This is not good. I mean, this is not good at all. And so we know, like, the next couple months are going to be crazy. It's after that's going to be even worse, right? Because there's still enough supply in 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 the works. It's just having a hard time getting to where it wants to go, right? But we're getting to the point where, like, you know, in Cal- the western part of the United States is in a severe drought. South America is in a se- severe drought. If you like coffee, buy coffee now, man, because uh, uh, the coffee uh, supply is wiped out. And then now you have, like, Caribou Coffee and Starbucks buying up everything, you know. And so uh, it's just get some coffee now. Uh, yeah, don't <laughs> you don't want to run out of coffee? But uh, that's a luxury item, but it's a good one. Uh, so uh, you know, it's just crazy to think of what's going on. And then you have food wars, you have water wars, like in Egypt, where they're damming up the Nile, you know. And then you have like uh, like China buying up American farms and American businesses, you know. Like I put out this morning. You know, and so, I mean, it, get get ready. It's coming, you know. Food and water is the, are the next weapons. I promise you this. This is a fast 300-year warning in this last two years, basically. Right. Three years, basically. Right, and so we're heading into a period where water wars, wa- uh, food rights, and that, it's coming. It's, there's no way around it. So the more you can do to, like, prepare yourself and start a home garden, that kind of stuff, you know, the better off you're going to be, mm-hmm. you know, and then... You know, if there's another pandemic, which I think there's going to be, uh, you're in for it as, as the world is, you know, because, I mean, I think it'll be a lot worse. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, any questions before we go? On to the next one. Good times. Okay. The disciples. We find something very interesting with the disciples on preparedness. Jesus gives the following direction. Carry neither purse nor bag nor sandals, and greet no one by name. And into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house, and if a son of peace is there, you shall uh, peace shall rest on it. 
top of page four. If not, it shall be uh, returned to you. Are we good in there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, page four. Okay. And if a son of peace is there, you shall rest. Uh, your peace shall rest on it. And if not, it shall return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking the things shared by them, for the labor is worthy of its hire. Do not move from house to house, and whatever city you enter, they uh, they receive you. Eat such things as set before you. Luke ten four through eight. Right. Okay, and so there he said, don't carry a purse, don't carry a bag, one pair of sins, don't, minimal. Okay, I'm saying you know, just minimal. Okay, so let's read the thing. It says, this would seem to imply that Christians should not provide for themselves. Jesus gave this command because they are amongst their own people. And tradition and culture and the law of God allowed for their well-being. That meaning they could have their needs met at the time through the law of the land and their countrymen. Right? Because it was their tradition to invite people in their house, take care of their needs, move them along their way. Okay? But there's a change. Let's see what it says. It says, now that they were sent out amongst the nations, Jesus tells them, right? Uh, let me read the top part. Sorry. I skipped it. said, yet Jesus changes his direction right before he dies. Here's what he says. And he said to them, when I sent you without person wallets and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, no, nothing. And he said to them, but now he who has a purse, let him take it. And likewise, his wallet. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. For I say to you, that this which is written must be yet accomplished in me. And he is reckoning among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, Lord, but here, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Luke 22, 35 through 38. Right? So we went from, don't bring anything for your provision. Don't worry about it. You will lack nothing. He's like, I love this part. He goes, did you guys lack? And then they go, no. What was that? That's a qualifying statement. He said, okay, because look at it. He said, do you like nothing? He goes, no, we didn't. He's like, okay, then listen to what I'm about to tell you. Because if the first thing was true, then you're going to need a sword. You're going to need a purse. You're going to need a garment. You're going to need all these things. And that's what he was telling. I am sending you amongst the nations. You're going to need protection. Right? And so he took that call of his saying, it's like, I, I told you the truth the first time. Believe me, you agree. We agree. Okay. Now you're going to need all that. Bring it with you. It's about to get bad. Okay. And so we see here, God was sending them out and he's like, you guys need preparation, right? Okay. So let's see. It says, now that uh, they will be sent out amongst the nations, Jesus tells them to prepare and to provide for their journey, even up to selling their stuff to do so. Again, we find the warning as being the first step to provision of God, then followed by an obedient action based in their preparations. Right. Okay. So we have a cool recap here from Paul and what he went through. Paul gives us a worthy recap of what it was like to being sent into the world. I have been in travels often and in dangers from waters and dangers from robbers and dangers from my race and dangers from the heathens and dangers in the city and dangers in the wilderness and dangers on the sea and dangers amongst false brothers. I have been in hardship and toil, often in watching and hungers and thirst and often in fastings and cold and nakedness. Besides the things outside conspiring against me daily, the care of all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, 26 through 28. Okay, was Paul a man of God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus personally talk to Paul? Yeah. Later in scripture says that Paul went and was taught by Jesus after he became a Christian for like two to three years. Right. Okay. So Paul, who wrote like over half the New Testament, right? Hungers, thirsting, fasted, nakedness in the depths of the sea. He's got, we could go on. The whole thing's not here. He'd been, he was whipped. He was beaten. Okay, guys, what does that say about Christians? I don't find in any of that that your life is going to be easy street. Right. It's no. Every day you have a good day is a blessing from God. Every day your needs are met are a blessing from God. Every day you get your bills paid, that's a blessing for God. We take it for granted. We think it's normal. It's not normal. It's God loving us and taking care of us. So every day we should celebrate all the good things we have and get some priority in our minds of what the blessing is. That's right. You know, and and so right. we can't just go and say, you know, uh, today is the day and it'll be like this tomorrow and it'll be like this forever. No, there's no guarantee of that in Scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, but we what we do find is those who love the Lord often are called into some tough situations to perform a function or action for God. And we have to be willing to do that. Right. And so if we look at all the disciples were martyred besides maybe John, there's debate on that one, you know, and uh, and Jesus and you're looking at Old Testament. So, guys, we, we see the trend. OK, 
So let's read uh, the next part. It says, Paul also gives us insight to exactly to exactly how God provided for their needs. Okay? I love this because it's kind of a... I'll, I'll see if you guys catch it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in any circumstance. I've experienced times of need and times of abundance. In, any, in every circumstance, I've learned the secret of contentment, whether I go satisfied or hungry... I have plenty or nothing. I'm able to do all things through the one who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you did well to share with me with uh, in my troubles. And so uh, you Philippians know, at the beginning of my gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, one on more than one occasion, you sent something for my need. I do not say this because I am seeking a gift. Rather, I seek the credit that abounds to your account. For I have received everything and have plenty. I have all I need because I received from uh, now you're going to try that. But you sent a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice, very pleasing to God. And I, and my God will supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. May glory be given to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Philippians 4, 11 through 20. Right? So let's see if you guys caught it. I, I wrote it down, so I'm just going to read what I wrote, okay? It says, just like in the church in Acts, God provided for Paul through the help of people of Christ. It takes people willing to act and perform their function to the utmost god uses people to help his people now here's the kicker i don't know if you guys caught this but i'll point it out now paul says something very interesting at the very end of the verse and my god will supply your every need according to his glorious riches in christ jesus mm -hmm. may the glory be given to god our father forever and ever amen right how could this be the man asking for the help is telling them that god will provide them for their needs <laughs> when you get you get the impression that god wasn't providing for paul deeds in in the uh, mystical sense that the church today preach that somehow it just happens he had to resort to asking for help from other people first this is how god helps people helping people finally i believe paul was referring to the following verse right the one who is gracious to the poor lends to the lord and the lord will repay him for his good deeds proverbs 19 17 right so paul was in need he was down and out he committed all his life to serving the gospel he went through all kinds of funk and unpleasantness right for jesus christ and then you got to the point like i'm hungry i need help i need paper to write on i need clothes you know i need a place to stay and so he, he resorts to asking the churches the churches respond they send the needed gifts and then paul goes listen god will do this too, for you too mm -hmm. that if you ever get to the point of need because you have helped you will be helped that's right. You know, and so that's what we have to understand. This is God's paradigm. This is how he works things out. That's why he talks about taking care of the widows and orphans. If God just sat up in heaven and doled out blessings to widows and orphans without using his people, well, he wouldn't need to tell us to go take care of widows and orphans mm -hmm. or those in prison. He'd just be doing it himself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what we find here is that God was like, partner with me, do these things. Right. And so he wants us to partner with him. OK. And that's what we have to take away from the study. So he wants you to partner with him in your own well-being. He wants to provide, but you have to get in gear and, you know, do the things he tells you to do. And then that way we can get it accomplished. Right. So what does it say here at the event? It says Paul was telling them that since you helped me in a time of need, God will make sure you receive help in your time of need, most likely through people. This is often accomplished by those who have full storehouses, be it a well-funded bank account or goods on hand as necessary for life or those with something to impart with a small storehouse. Either way, it's hard to provide for the needs of the saints when you yourself do not have it in the first place, right? That's right. And so God blesses us so we can bless others, okay? So we're going to look at the blessing of the storehouse at the bottom of page 5. The idea of planting and gathering and then storing in silos has been around since the dawn of time. It's only a recent creation of the modern world system for you not to harvest crops and store them for the year or have a root cellar full of provisions. Now the world teaches you to only provide for today and depend upon the world to provide for tomorrow. When biblically speaking, this misses the mark when it comes to the blessing of the storehouse. The Western style of living, of shopping daily, running out of something, then running out to replace it, is the opposite of planning for the future. Actually, the amount of faith imparted to the world, of, world system of commerce is very high to the point of servitude and worship. Okay? It, only up until like the 1950s, they had root cellars and storage underground and they had a supply of food mm -hmm. up until then because at the supermarkets you have just-in-time fulfillment that's why the supply chain's breaking down in other words you used to go to uh, like a walmart or store like that and they'd have the store and they'd have a warehouse behind the store 
behind the stores, they'd clean, put all the food and store it, and as they needed, they'd bring it in. They got rid of the back of the storehouse store, you know, mm-hmm. the storage area. Now you go there, it's real thin, it's narrow, there's boxes and stuff, there's place for trucks to come in and drop off, but immediately be pushed out into the aisles. For week by week. Yeah, right, and sometimes day by day, you know? And so what we've gotten to a point now is that, like, if you run out, well, we'll wait for a truck to get here. They don't walk in the back and get, like, you know, enough food to fill the store again. And they might have little sections of things, but overall, it's just in time fulfillment, you know? And so the same thing has happened to humanity. They say the average house has two to three days worth of food in it, mm-hmm. right? That's insane to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I'm like, first of all, how do you, like I have six people in my family. How do you just shop for two to three days? First of all, I don't want to waste gas to go back to the store every, back and, forth, back and, forth. and the time it takes, mm-hmm. it's dumb, <laughs> right? So I'm like, well, most people eat out now. Well, that's a waste of money, mm-hmm. you know? And so, but anyways, so we get to the point where like people are just like, they're in this cycle and they're being taught that it'll always be there. Depend, depend, depend. Well, that dependence is putting you in a very bad situation where, you know, if they ever decide to tighten that noose around your neck and not provide for you Mm -hmm. and make you subject like in Australia and France where you can't go grocery shopping Mm -hmm. and you have nothing for yourself, you're, you're allowing yourself to be put in position of subjection. Right. Because you don't know how to store it for yourself, at least something. That's right. Now, before we go on, we're talking about the Blessing Storehouse. Let me give you a couple of good examples. Okay, there's two things you can do here. There's something called copy canning. Do you guys know what copy canning is? No. Okay, so copy canning is is you have one can of tomato soup on your shelf, right? Mm-hmm. You're hungry for some tomato soup. You take that, that can of tomato soup and you eat it. Mm-hmm. You put it on your grocery list to get two. And now you got two on your shelf, and you eat another one. You always replace the one you eat with two more. Okay, I've heard that in a different term. Yeah, and so it's called copy canning. It's a real easy way to build up a little bit of supply. It doesn't cost a lot. You can do it over a long period of time. You just have to keep cycling your food cycles out, and it's copy canning, right? So that's one easy way to do it. You know, you use a box, buy two to replace it. Next time you eat another one, buy two more to replace that one. Before you know it, you got a little cushion, right? The uh, Ready.gov and stuff, they tell you to keep two to three days of supply of food on your house. I'm like, you guys are morons. I don't know who Uh eats at your house. I'm sure their houses are well stocked, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and so, and the other thing is this. Let's use the two or three day thing because that's ignorant, but we'll use it for (laughs) teaching purposes. (laughs) Um, So, say you think the world's ending and things are bad, right? And put your number in here. I'm not going to give you a number. You put your number in here. Okay, so you you think three days of food is what you're going to need to survive what's coming, right? You're taking ready.gov advice, and I don't know why, but uh, and then you're thinking, this is a great idea, you know? And so you go and you buy two or three days, you buy three days worth of food, right? Okay, you're ready to sit this one out. Big storm's coming, right? You use, right, a day's worth of food. You should go back and immediately replace that day's worth of food. Right, and so you're always creating a three day buffer for yourself, okay? And that way, so if it's a week, three weeks, you bought three weeks of food, you used up a week, buy and replace that week, and now you're back to three weeks. And you always keep that goal post out there, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're always putting a buffer between you and society. Now, people are like, Well, you're hoarding, that's not hoarding if there's plentiful supply, right. right? So if there's a, a, a a glut of grass seed and you go out and buy 50 bags of grass seed because it's on sale and you plan and you have acreage and you want to plant grass it's not hoarding that you're out buying goods you know people are buying tons of alcohol is that hoarding alcohol or you know anything clothes it's not hoarding hoarding okay is when the 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 thing hits like everybody said during COVID 19 all the preppers were hoarding all the preppers are already prepared they stayed home it was everybody else who wasn't prepared mm-hmm. that ran out and emptied store shelves. Yep. You know, and so we don't want to be a part of the problem. People who keep a supply at home when times are good actually alleviate the stress off the system. 
they're not hoarders. They're problem solvers. Because not only do you have enough for yourself, you have enough for your neighbor or your loved one that kind of help people build a bridge to when they need are able to go for themselves again. You know, and so preparing yourself, be, building a two day buffer or three day buffer, you know, for yourself, that's not a bad thing. That's a beautiful thing, right? And so when it hits, you get to stay home. You get to avoid the craziness, all the, the yuck yuck that's going out, on out there. You can help your neighbor, help your family, right? And so we got copy canning, easy, cheap, you know, replace, use one, replace it with two, do that over a year. I promise you're going to have tons of food, you know, you'll have your three days. And then, um, you know, or if you have the funds, buy what you think you're going to need for however long you think you're going to need it, and then always replace it, you know, and just keep pushing that goalpost away from you. You know, and that run out date. You're right. And so most people are like, well, that's uh, selfish of you. I was like, no, it's called meal planning. Yes. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, right now, like I was at Dollar General. The lady, I was talking to her. She's like, they're sending us trucks. We have no place to put the stuff. Because wow. Dollar General's worried that the supply chain's going to break. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to get as much in as they possibly can. So that's not weird for a business to do it, is it? Or Caribou Coffee buying up all the coffee, right? That's not weird. They have businesses, right? They have people, they have business they have to pay for, uh, uh, employees to pay for, uh, uh, structures to pay for. I mean, they have a whole thing to pay for. So they're trying to prepare for it. So if the government builds a, a bunker in Cheyenne Mountain and fill it full with all the freeze-dried fruit from Augustine Farms and puts them out of business for 90 days, is that bad? No, they're the government. They need to be fed. Their ar the army needs to be fed. They want to do fake recalls of a bunch of food mm -hmm. so they could take it all off the market all at one time. They do that. Yeah, like they just did with DiGiorno pizzas. Mm -hmm. You know, right. uh, yeah, look it up. And, uh, you know, is that wrong? Well, not. it's kind of backhanded because they're preventing other people from buying food. But at the same time, you understand why they're doing it. I do. Of course. I mean, yeah. 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 And they say an army marches on his stomach. Absolutely right. You know, so why is it wrong for you to do the same? It isn't. Right. It, yeah. And God, there's so many stories throughout the Bible that provision, provision, God first uh, taught us provision during manna. Right. He provided for us every day. Now I'm teaching you how to provide, mm -hmm. paying attention, and obeying. Right. Do what I say. Right. And so it's not strange. It's not abnormal. It's normal human life and existence to take care of your family and to store up and to do what the things you think you're going to need to do, you know, to take care of your family. Don't trust anybody else to do it for you. Don't trust the government to come to your aid. You know, don't trust any of it. You have a divine responsibility to take care of yourself. You know, and then help take care of other people in the body of Christ. Okay, so let's look at the blessing of the storehouse. Now that we talked about this, said, Res that's all right. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of a, a foreign uh, foreigner's sons, because their mouth has spoken vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. So that our sons may be like plants grown up in their youth, and our daughters may be like cornerstones polished like a uh, palace building. And our storehouses, dun, pow, may be full, furnishing kind to kind, and our flocks may breed thousands and ten thousands outside, and our oxen may be loaded. There is no breaking, nor going out, and nor crying out in our streets. Blessed are the people who are so blessed are the people to whom Jehovah is their God. Psalms 144, 11 through 15, right? So you got storehouses full. You got flocks. Your, your animals are producing. Everybody wants to talk about Deuteronomy. You'll be the head and not your tail. What is the blessing then? If you keep my commandments, that your your uh, meal crews would be full and your dough will be blessed and your fruit of your womb will be blessed. The animals will be blessed, right? And so this is a blessing God wants to give, right? You're right. And so we want to keep that in mind that this is a good thing. Having a storehouse full is a blessing of God. So here we find the cry of the blessing of the full storehouse and plentiful crops and livestock. This blessing is sought after. It is no strange thing to want to secure for yourselves a more sure future. This is permissible under the guidance of always seeking the kingdom of heaven first. Now, you guys want to know something real stupid? Here's something real stupid. The government, like through Obamacare, tried to insist you buy health insurance that you might not need and might not have been able to afford, mm -hmm. right? But then they turn around and tell you, only keep two, two or three days worth of food at your house, which you're definitely going to need. You're definitely going to have to eat past three days, okay? They'll tell you the logic of the government is beyond me, 
All right, you might need health insurance. You're definitely going to die of starvation in two weeks. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you're going to die of thirst in three to four days. Right? So listen, guys, if you stop eating today and stop drinking today, in about three weeks, I will not see you again. (laughs) Right? It's like, you're, you're going out of here, okay, guys? And so, obviously, the government's planning schedule is a little off. But, uh, so let's keep that in mind. Okay, here, um... Okay, here we find the cry for blessing of full storehouses, plentiful crops, and livestock. This blessing is sought after. It is no strange thing that one is secure for yourself and more sure future. This is permissible under the guidance of always seeking the kingdom of heaven first. That's key, which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's talk about manna. Let's like, take a look at the miracle of manna, bread from heaven. Walking through a desolate desert with no natural provision, the Israelites had to have a miracle to survive. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to him, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. Exodus 16, 15 through 16. So after a natural, so this is them in the desert. They left Egypt. Okay, so they fasted the first day or two after they left Egypt. But God even provided for that because he told them the night before, fill yourself full of lamb. Like the Mm -hmm. command was to eat up the lamb. So, you know, engage, like eat a bunch of lamb, get a full stomach. You're going to be marching without nothing for a little bit. Right. I think the reason why is that the land was cursed. Right, and so God has had to move them out of the land far enough to start raining down a blessing because the land was sold over to Satan through blood sacrifice and all this other stuff, you know. And so He was pulling them out of there, right? And so here they're in the middle of nowhere, right? And so God was like, they have to have a miracle to survive, right? They're at the point they have trusted me, they have done what I said, and they are following my command. So now it's up to me to do this mighty miracle, right? And so after natural provision became available, God stopped raining down manna. At this point, they had to gather and store the fruit of the land. It says, The children of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came into an inhabitable land. They ate the manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. Exodus 16.35 So as soon as they got to the promised land, God was like, "Uh Uh-uh, no more of that. There is food here for you, right? So manna was given when there was no earthly provision available. Yet as soon as there was earthly provision available, they could be gathered and stored, stored. The manna stopped. Right? So what do we see in this? So what similarities can we find in these two types of provisions? At the bottom of page six, uh, uh, what similarities can be found? Uh, we find in these two types of provisions? First and foremost, no matter what, they still had to work at gathering. They still had to participate. God wasn't just filling up their refrigerators like, uh, you know, he was like, oh, I'll breathe. I'll do my part. You do your part. Get out and get it and do exactly how I told you to do. Right. And he gave him a, a measurement. Right. He said failure to partner with God through personal effort would have spelled out disaster. Actually, you would be hard pressed to find any miracle in scripture that did not combine efforts between God and man. So what we have here, guys, is even the manna took action. You know, they couldn't just sit in their tents and be like, God's got this. He's like, no, I got it this far. You do the rest of it, right? And so what happens here at the end of time where people are misappropriating the funds God has provided them to spend their money on things that don't really matter to their their physical needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're going to be in big trouble at the end of time if we're still investing into nice cars, nice houses and stuff. It's not wrong to have a car, not wrong to have a house. But if you get so strung over a barrel that your car payment is way more than you can afford and it leaves you no extra money to take care of your earthly needs, that is a bad decision, guys. I know people like that. I could call them right now on my phone and talk to them. (laughs) Where they have done some dumb things and wondered why they're having a hard time to pay their bills. I was like, first of all, you didn't manage your money well, right? You didn't put it where it was supposed to go. You put it in bad spots. That's not God's fault. That's your fault, right? And so we have to be very mindful of what we do with our funds at the end of time, especially as things get more expensive, right? And so that means start cutting out things, getting rid of things, prioritizing things, find new joys and new things because, you know what, not all things are going to be affordable at the end of time as we get towards things being worse, okay? Any questions before we go on? 
<laughs> warning and uh, warnings in a balance in a in balance. Okay, so here we have. We know that we need to prepare, right? We need to prepare for our physical needs, the physical protection, as Chad pointed out. We need to do these things, right? But now we need some context, right? Because it's easy to get like prepper brain where you know you're getting your priorities out of whack even with that so we have to find this beautiful balance of like okay how do we do this okay so what does it say we must put forth effort it says do not be deceived god will not be made a fool for a person will reap what he sows galatians 6 7 right so we can't sit there and just just doesn't mess everything up and uh and then expect god to come fix it for us we talked about a second ago about misappropriating your funds where you're investing your money Right. What you're doing with your time, you know, and so we can't sit there and point our finger at God. You didn't provide for me. And you'll be like, no, I did. You just squandered the blessing. Right. So we have to really get our minds set in the right direction. OK, next one. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler. She prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. Right? Now, what is this saying? It's saying, like, listen, even the dumb ant knows how to take care of themselves. Right? Even the dumb ant gets up and goes gets to work and, you know, provides for his own household, his own hive or whatever they're called. Right? And so what is it saying? It's saying, listen, guys, if the dumb animal, dumb insect can figure out how to do it, you as a human being should be able to figure out how to do it too. Right? I mean, and so, but the government wants you to just trust the government and not seek after your own well-being. First of all, it's not the government's job to take care of us. It's the government's job to abide by the Constitution, to provide defense of our borders and uh, interstate commerce through the nations. Right? That's right. And so there, that's the feds. Okay? And then you got your local government. But, uh... Here we have an idea given to us by God and through Solomon that, listen, guys, ants know how to do it. Be better than an ant. All right. Okay. So whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. Proverbs 28, 19. Now, we, now this back then, this meant something probably a little different to us. So if we're industrious, if we're applying ourselves to things, if we're providing for our family, if we're working our land, we can physically do that or doing other things. But what he's saying is, though, basically, if you want to avoid want and poverty and lack, get to work, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Now, we saw Paul, who was want in poverty, not because he wasn't doing the right thing, because the Bible says the man who works for the gospel is supposed to live off the gospel, right? So he was obedient and obeying. That's what ministers do. That's what I'm doing, right? And so that is the work of God. And so, and even in uh, in the book of Acts, he said, should uh, Peter and them were talking about, should we leave the gospel of Jesus Christ to wait tables, right? And to the ministering of the goods. And he was like, no, far be it. You guys figure it out. We got other things to do. And so even the ministers like myself, this is my job. This is my work. And this is where I'm being industrious. And then you have people like, you know, Chad who does his thing and, you know, other people. And so work your field, work your plan, do whatever it is. But God's basically saying that, listen, guys, I give you the ability to be fruitful and to produce and to do right. And so do those things. And then you won't have poverty. It won't come upon you, you know? And so we have to understand we have a big part on our own well being, right? And so we trust God. And so that's what this next part is. We're talking about trusting God. Okay. It says, don't put your trust in your preps. Okay, Jesus warns us of this. He then told them a parable. The land of certain rich men produced an abundant crop. So he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And I will store all my grain and my goods. And, and I will say to myself, you have plenty of goods stored up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and celebrate. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded back from you. But who will get what you have prepared for yourself? So is it with those who stores up riches for himself but is not rich towards God. Luke. 12 16 through 21 right so there's a dual purpose here in other words this guy was putting his trust in his own well-being and he had a plan i'm gonna just do nothing and he forgot god right but at the same time for us in our study what we want to look at is we never want to put our trust in our preps because all those things can fail 
right? And so what is it when you, you prepare yourself and you're trying to get prepared for what's coming and take care of your household? You're being a responsible individual before God. That's what you're doing. It's up to God to do the rest. You do your part, let God do his part, right? And so let's keep reading. And charge them that are rich in this world that they may not be high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6, 17. So here we are told that no matter what, not to put our hearts to our preparations as the key to our well-being. It's not. God is the key. He is the blessing that sustains us. If we have a little or a lot, it's nothing without the blessing of God upon it. So do your part and what you can do and trust God for everything else. Yeah. Right? And so we are called to take what God has given us and be good stewards of it. I don't have a lot of money. You know, I have limited funds, right? But I promise you, I'm doing everything I can, the best of my ability to take care of my family, right? And that is what is required of me. Now, if somebody's making $100,000, $200,000 a year and has an expendable income of two or three grand a month or something like that, they have way more options than I would ever have, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't matter. What matters is the blessing of God on what you've done. If you've really done your best and you know you've prioritized and not put in entertainment and all these other things as your peak thing, but taking care of the earthly needs, then you can trust God that he's going to be with you and help you out. Okay, so here we have Jesus telling us, don't stress out and worry about life. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you eat or what you drink or about your body and what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? And which of you, by worrying, can add even one hour to his life? Why do you worry about clothing? Think about how the flowers of the field grow. They do not work or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory has was clothed like one of these. And if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is tossed into the fire to heat the oven, won't he clothe you even more? You people of little faith. I'll let you flip your pages. Uh, so then, don't worry. Uh, so then, don't worry in saying what we will eat, what shall we drink, or what will we wear for the... The, for the unconverted pursue these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So then, don't worry about tomorrow, and for tomorrow worry about itself. Today has enough troubles of its own. Matthew 6, 25, 34. This verse, this saying, messes a lot of people's brain up on preparations. Okay, so let me point out a couple of things. He is not saying, do not attend to these needs. Nope, he did not say that. He said, yet yeah, don't worry and stress and faint over them. As we see in this verse, you're required by God to attend to them. It says, your family. But if someone does not provide for his own family, especially uh, his own, especially his own family, he has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. First mm -hmm. Timothy 5.8. What does that mean? So Jesus is saying, don't worry. Like, don't let it be like this soul crushing thing. Like, oh, no, what am I going to eat? You know, we, we've learned it. We're learning. Get to work. Do your part. Take what God has provided. Use it to take care of your family, right? God has given you the ability to produce wealth and to produce goods and do things, right? So prioritize them, man them, right? But don't sit there and let it crush you. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he said, don't worry about it. We have to attend to those needs. And so what do we have here? We have uh, uh, your family, Rich, right? Next one. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Proverbs 13, 22, right? So the Bible tells you a good man leaves an inheritance. How can you leave an inheritance if you're not producing, building, and storing wealth of some type, form, or kind? Right. It is an impossibility. So Jesus says, don't worry about it. Don't let it crush you. Don't make it like you wake up every morning and it's your single greatest thing. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. He knows you need these things. He'll provide opportunity and the ability to take care of these things. And then the Bible teaches us that as he does, store those up for your family. Provide for your own. Don't be an unbeliever worse than a dog. Right? So we have to balance this in our brain where we understand our responsibility to prepare for the storm ahead of us. But we don't put our trust in our faith and our confidence of what we've done. We put that in God and Jesus. He's our shelter. He's our, our protection. He's our provision, right? But God does it in many different ways. And so we have to always keep balance, right? And not get, like I saw a lady on TV that her, literally her whole house, floor to ceiling was food. That's ignorant. How are you going to even eat all that? I don't know. You know, and her bed was propped up on containers of food. I'm like, you are a nut. You know, but whatever. <laughs> It'd be easy to get a nighttime snack. <laughs> Just crawl into your bed and open something up. But anyway, 
Okay, your fellow man, right? But whosoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart of compassion against him, how does God love remain in him? First John three seventeen. Right? So we're supposed to provide for those around us. Right? Next one. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Mm-hmm. So also by faith, um, uh, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James 2, 15 through 17. Right? So we have to take Jesus's don't worry in context. A lot of Christians are like, Oh, God's got this. Mm-hmm. No. They totally take it out of what Jesus was trying to say. You know, and we've learned through the apostles and what we read with Paul, he, he was hungry. He needed help. He asked for help. That's right. But God kept them alive, right? And so we kind of, we're kind of spoiled. We don't literally have to eat every day to survive as human beings. Mm-hmm. We're used to eating three times a day to survive as human beings and snacks included, right? And so we have to remember that, hey, guys, God's provision might seem a little different than what we're used to, what we've been taught and what we've been trained. But if you're alive and you got some clothes on your back and you're making it through life, that's God providing. Okay. And uh, Uh, daily bread. So this is a very interesting thing. You might not have known. And I think you'll find this very interesting. Okay. Because it says, let us remember that Jesus spoke in Aramaic and it was translated into Greek, Latin, and English. As we look at the word daily, we must understand that Jesus coined this expression most likely taken from Nazarene slang. It's been translated to daily, but has a deeper meaning than daily. It says, give us today our daily bread. Matthew 6, 11, right? So let's take a quick look at some commentaries on the verse. Joseph Benson's commentary of the Old and New Testament. It says, give us this day our daily bread, as the original word, which I can't speak Greek, here rendered daily, is not found anywhere else, neither in the lexicon, nor in Greek uh, or any Greek author, nor in any other part of the New Testament, save the parallel passage in Luke, right? So it's a very special word he used here. John Gill's exposition of the Bible. Give us this day our daily bread. The Arabic version reads it this way. Our bread for tomorrow. And Jerome says that in the Hebrew gospel used by Nazarenes, he found the word, which I can't pronounce, which signifies tomorrow, right? So when we read this verse, it is best translated this way. Give us today our bread for tomorrow. Right. The idea being that God not only provides for your current moment, but for your many tomorrows. With Noah, we find God giving him his daily bread by telling him to store up. We find God giving the daily bread to the Israelites by telling them to go and collect. We find God providing daily bread to the church and acts years in advance, etc., etc. It all boils down to this. If there are natural provisions to gather, then gather. When there are no provision to gather, trust God for the miracle. Right. And so when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. He said, give us this day our bread for tomorrow. Hmm. So that's beyond. A lot of Christians are like, well, God will give us daily bread. No, God will give you more than daily bread. Right? God will give you enough, not just for today, but for tomorrow and the next uh, and the next day. Okay? And so in my study of that verse, I had tons of notes on this verse, but I just boiled it down because we don't have 100 hours to sit and talk about it. But there was an idea back in the day that you would eat your bread you're at dinner, right? And then you would save half of it for breakfast, you know, to ensure that when you woke up, you had something to eat. And then you'll go about your day to find more bread to do the same thing the next day. Eat at night, wake up, eat in the morning, you know, and that's how they did it. And so the illusion there is, of course, we know, right, that obviously if you take this verse to the extreme, as a lot of Christians want to, and say, give us this daily bread. Well, would that imply to shop for more than one day's worth of food is lack of faith? Obviously not. Because if they're like, well, we should trust God every day for our daily bread. Okay, the next time you go shopping, only buy for today. And then go back again the next day and do that for It's ignorant, right? And so when it says bread, does he only mean bread? Right. He means all your provisions, everything you need, Right. Your house, your well-being, your health, your children, clothes, cars, whatever you need to do in life. That's he means all of it. Right. And so what are you saying? Give us today our daily bread. Give us our bread for tomorrow. Give us what we need today to accomplish our goals for tomorrow. Right. And so he gives us the ability to do this when we understand our partnership with him in preparing ourselves in our house. Right. We don't worry about it. We don't stress. We don't cry about it. We just get the work. Right. We don't make it a big emotional event. It's nothing. It's just a command from the Lord to take care of your family. You store it up and you go about your day. Here's what it does do for you, though. Once you have your three days of supplies on hand, um, 
you you can rest a little easier. You can breathe a little easier. You you have a little more confidence in what you're doing. And here's the kicker about all of it is that after you get in that cycle, guess what, guys? Your money's freed up, right? After you do your initial or whatever, after that, your money's freed up. You can go back to living normal. You can do whatever you like. You've done, done your business, right? And then it's just back to re regular life. But what you've done is you invested some money to create a two or three day buffer. And then, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and after that, you're good. Cool. You're good. Okay. And so it's a beautiful place to be. I promise. Okay. So let's recap as we get to the end. As we see, it takes a balanced heart, mind, and spirit to accomplish the goal of preparedness, to fill the storehouses with the blessing of God, but put our faith in God, not his blessing. Just as Noah would have been foolish to trust in the ark instead of God that instructed him to build it, we must partner with God through faith to accomplish his will. If that means gather, then we gather. If that means to wait for a miracle, then we wait. But woe unto those who do not know the season, right? Right now, I promise you, we're in the gather season. There's going to become a wait for a miracle season, I promise you. Because it doesn't matter how much you prep for, you'll never prep enough. You'll never have enough on hand. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to, one, take care of our family, take burden off the system if something bad happens, to be able to take care of our neighbors and those we love and trust, right? What are we doing? We're becoming a solution to a problem. We're not the problem. They want to tell you in the news that people are preppers or problems are taking. No, they're the, the solution. There's what they're the ones that are going to make society work, and then keep the the burden off the system when something bad happens. You know, and so uh, I sent out all those texts to somebody who's like, why would you even share this information with anybody? One of the texts is like, because I don't want people to be part of the problem when it happens. That's right. They, I want people to be the solution. Noah warned everybody. Right. And so, like, if you're not at home at night, how desperate will a man get if he can't feed his family? Mm -hmm. They say we're nine meals away from anarchy. You give, you take away people's food for three days. That's it. It's game on. People will do whatever they can to try to go and get. Mm -hmm. Looks like it could happen. Oh, it looks like it's going to happen for sure. They need it to happen to institute the mark of the beast. They're making it happen. I, I, I guarantee you they're making it happen. And so they're going to make it happen to institute the mark of the beast, to go get you to line up at your children's school to sign up for your food aid. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous, right? And so forget all that. So they can't even afford to, to supply food for the majority of kids in school. Right, yeah, like in Alabama and a lot of uh, school systems are failing to provide breakfast and half the time and lunch. You know, and we're just at the very tip of the iceberg, guys. We're at the one, we're at the point where there's an opportunity. It changed so rapidly when people stopped having their own gardens and stopped preparing having when we went to industrial versus independent, where we could grow our own gardens, right. raise our own cattle, be self-sufficient, we that's been, we gave that away with we right. want it now attitude. And we want it now, we want it cheap. But like you know, during the Great Depression, where families could still have a family farm mm -hmm. and grow some stuff and can some stuff, you might be eating the same sauerkraut for uh, six <laughs> months or kimchi. You know, mm -hmm. but you're eating and you're alive. Now that's not even in existence anymore. People don't don't really do that on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we want to get back to that. That's right. You know, and so get non heirloom seeds and you know, and uh, I mean not hybrid uh, seeds and you know stuff that is good for your area and stuff like that. But anyways, the point being this, guys. That listen, we have to know what season we're in. We have to know what is going on. We have to be aware. We have to be part of the solution. We don't want to be part of the problem, right? We want to help society exist and survive. The whole lone wolf thing is idiotic. A lot of these preppers are morons because they think, well, I'm going to go hole up in a hole. And I was like, no, you're going to die alone. And people are going to come take your stuff. Mm -hmm. It takes community. It takes society. It takes your neighbors. It takes everybody to keep everyone strong. That's how you survive. Mm -hmm. That's the only way it works. Now, there might be a time where you have to be alone for a little bit because things have gotten bad. But I promise you, the most, the more you can do for your neighbor, the more for you can do for your mm -hmm. family, the better off everyone's going to be. Make sure that you know your neighbor's pretty good around yeah no good and what, what neighbors you can help and which ones you can't but that's the same point you know here's the thing we don't worship our preparations we don't worship our supplies we have to be able to walk away from them if god tells us to or give them away if god tells us to mm -hmm. right but at the same time we can't sit there it's like we talked about the five loaves and the two fishes that one boy was smart enough to bring his lunch 
you know, why everybody else was not brilliant enough to realize that eventually they're going to want to eat, you know, and God was able to use that or with Elijah with the uh, flour and the oil, you know, and that blessed and yeah. last and did not run out, you know. So God could take a can of tuna and turn it into a miracle, you know, but he likes to use the earthly things to do those miracles, exactly. you know, and so we want to make sure we're doing our part <laughs> and focusing on what matters most. OK, so let's read the last two verses. All right, knowing the seasons, for everything there is an appointed time and an ap appropriate time for every activity on earth. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what was planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give something up as lost, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to rip, uh, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate and a time for war and a time for peace ecclesiastes 3 1 through 8 know what time and what season we're in obviously guys it's not a great thing we're going into most of the world is walking in into blindly and they're expecting the government to fix it for them and they're just going to get hit in the face like you know someone walking around the corner getting jumped you know and so but we have an opportunity now okay we had, God has warned us. Well, we talked about it earlier. The warning is part of the provision. Mm -hmm. You know, so if we're keeping things in our life and saying and spending our money on it, but saying we don't have money to buy food. Mm -hmm. No, you do. You're just wasting your money. That's right. You know, prioritize, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And so let's read the last verse. It says, Commit your deeds to Yahweh, and your plans shall succeed. Proverbs 16:3. In other words, mm -hmm. seek first the kingdom of heaven. Put that first. Know it is your responsibility to take care of your family and loved ones in the body of Christ. Right? And then do what you have to do, but don't put your faith in what you're, you've done. Right? Put your faith in Christ. It is him. Right? And so what does this do? It helps us realize God gives us warning. He prepares our hearts and minds. He has allows us an opportunity to put two or three days worth of food aside. And after that's done... We don't look at it as if it's some oracle of blessing and like we worship what we've done. No, it's just something to be used as a tool for his benefit, for our benefit, for the body of Christ. And we do with it as he tells us to do, right? And then we move on with our life. But woe unto the Christian who won't do this. <laughs> won't listen, won't hear the, right. Hear the call. Right. And I don't want to put into anybody's heart and mind this idea that like, you know, you have to become a prepper nut. You know, or some of these people just take it way too far, mm -hmm. you know. And so we have to get to the point where we just commit to what we're doing. We live that copy canning style life. We create that buffer of three days and replace the day we use and keep that goal post far out. That's just common sense. You go around to the uh, third world, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. They know how to plan for their future because it's so uncertain. That's right. You know, and so we need to take just... Take advantage of every institution you have to get... Right. And sometimes you do have to get pushy in order for they do. Right. But if we obey and listen to the Lord and do what he says and do what he says. Right. He, that's when he won't leave us or forsake Right. Us. Stay in his will. Fulfill your side of the bargain. Work, partner with him. And you're going to be just fine. You know. Cause, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was thinking way back, way back to when I was first married, 17 years old, and we... We both had little meaning, meaning, unmeaningful jobs right. to keep things going. And we would pray over our food to make it last and thank God for what we had. And we paid our tithes off. Of right. Our, and tithes and offerings huge. Right. We want to be super blessed. Right. God will never forsake you to right. help others. And um, I remember one night we had, we had one of the biggest things we always had to eat was potatoes because they were cheap. Right. You could eat potatoes for everything, and we were so tired of potatoes. Well, thank God for it. Right. We were on our last two potatoes, and I went in and fried them. Tonight we're going to have fried potatoes. You know, <laughs> last night was baked potatoes. It's like ramen. How many ways can you make ramen? <laughs> and I remember there was a knock on our little apartment door, and we went to it, and his parents showed up with bags of groceries. And then it got to a point again. My mom and dad knew exactly in the spirit when to come in but we needed to know that lesson right of trust, trust in the right Lord. we didn't ask right but god used them to deliver and right if they weren't heeding the call of the lord right our hearts are not susceptible to hearing that word and right hearing the voice 
who are we hindering? Who are we not helping? Right. We can be causing people to starve spiritually and physically. Right. No, exactly right. And we don't want to shut up our hearts to blessing people and helping no, people. Exactly. You know, and so, you know, praise God. Okay, any questions or anything before we pray? This is very good teaching. Yeah, praise God. All right, you guys ready to pray? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Exactly. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful teaching, for helping us understand our part in this whole thing and how you provide and how you look out for us. And you want a partner, and we want to be your partner. And so give us guidance on what we should do and how to best prepare our house and families and be able to be a blessing to those we love, and especially in the body of Christ and our neighbors and those around us. And so we praise you, we thank you, and we love you very much. And uh, be with us and protect us in these evil days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com